Welcome, each and every one of you, to Suds and Science, our, our monthly informal gathering here at the Inn. Thank you to the Inn, and we are the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Many of you know about us, so I won't give you a high five about that. But uh, this is a wonderful informal gathering where we have a, a speaker come in and tell us about something. Tonight we're going to hear about rivers from Brian Dave. Um, I'm just going to quickly preview the next two before I introduce Brian. Um, next month we'll have Eric Hansen, who is a balloon biologist from BC. He gave a talk last fall, which was, I think, our most popular yeah. yet. We had standing room only for that. So he'll be back. And then Charlie Cogville, who is um, one of the preeminent experts on pre-settlement forests in the Northeast. He's going to give a talk in May. That should be really fascinating. So you'll hear about those, but there's a little preview. But tonight, we are lucky to have Brian Day with us. BCE is lucky to have Brian Day on our board. Brian joined uh, fairly recently. He is the chair of the Earth Sciences Department at Dartmouth. So he's an expert in geomorphology. And I don't know much about geomorphology, but I think I'm going to learn something tonight. So we're delighted to have you here, Brian. And the last thing I want to say is that I encourage each and every one of you to participate in the local election that is underway. <laughs> Not the one that took place today that ended just a couple of minutes ago, but the one that Dana Witz is having for uh, the favorite nonprofit in the Upper Valley. So each and every one of you can cast your vote, dollar a vote, as many votes as you like. Um, all of the money that is raised for BCE goes to BCE and all the others organizations will receive their votes. So um, please vote for BC if you believe in us. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't. So Brian, thank you for coming and let's go. Good evening folks, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I think it's gonna be a little different from what you're used to. I'm not a card carrying biologist. Uh, I'm not even an avocational birder, except when they, when they come up, they fly across my path when I'm out hiking, and I am a, an avid hiker. But I really do enjoy my affiliation with uh, VCE, great people there, really. So, uh, what am I doing here? I'm going to talk a little bit about rivers, and what I'd like to do is give you uh, just a brief overview of some of the research that we're taking on. Uh, kind of hard to do without exhibits. I did bring along, I, I know it's kind of against the rules, but I brought along some demonstration pieces just to make sure either you're still awake or I'm still awake or something like that. So my interest, my specialty is, I'm actually uh, something of a physicist. I'm interested in the physical processes that uh, sculpt the landscape, the world in which we live. And so I guess that's where I come in. The title I chose for tonight, a little catchy, uh, I, what was it? No one ever steps in the same river twice, and yet. Heraclitus. Heraclitus, uh, Socratic uh, philosopher in Athens, about 500 BC. And um, the actual quote is, excuse the gender, uh, no man ever steps in the same river twice, never the same man, never the same river. And a wonderful metaphor, great canny insight on the dynamic aspects of rivers and indeed the world in which we live. And if you're of a certain philosophical bent, the dynamism of man. And to take that metaphor even further, um, we've come to understand rivers as dynamic and uh, members of a class of natural phenomena that we refer to as self-forming phenomena. That is, the form of a river channel itself, in this case. It reflects the processes going on within that channel. Right? And again, as I say, if you're of a philosophical bent, uh, I suppose man and women are uh, a self-forming phenomenon as well. We create our own fate. As one geomorphologist or a person who studies the landscape in a systematic way said, uh, and this geomorphologist, his name was Luna Leopold, more about that in a moment, his wonderful quote was that a river is the carpenter of its own edifice. Um, I just, that one just sticks with me. I really like that. Could you say it again? Could you speak up? Yep, sure. Here? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try to speak up a little louder. Uh, Luna Leopold was the second child, second son of Aldo and Estelle Leopold of Sand County Almanac. Uh, the Leopolds had five children. They lived this wonderful natural experiment in a um, 
refurbished chicken shack in Wisconsin, and all five children grew up to be uh, academics and conservation biologists. And at least three of them were PhDs. Two of them were on the faculty at Berkeley at some time. So uh, just wonderful. So Luna Leopold was a world-renowned geomorphologist, uh, student of rivers. And he's the one that coined that phrase, carpenter of its own edifice. Um, right. So, in fact, many great minds, not only Luna Leopold and Heraclitus, have thought uh, about rivers. No less than, wait for it, Albert Einstein published a paper in 1926 in the Journal of Natural Sciences. It has a German name that I can't pronounce, but translated. It's the Natural Sciences. What is it? Not your Wissenschaft. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> wow, that's good. What he said. Somebody challenged me. <laughs> no, no, that's it. I recognize it. I just can't say it. I can't. Uh, the, the cause of the formation of meanders and the course of rivers, 1926. And basically, I'm going to demonstrate, because this was his actual thought experiment, as you know. Albert was uh, famous for thought experiments, some of which are unfathomable to me, but this one I get. <laughs> um, so what I have here is a large beaker. His thought experiment is actually a, a teacup with tea leaves in it. And what happens when you stir the teacup, all right? I need an assistant. Could I be the assistant? Could you just yeah. shine that? Can everybody kind of see the grains on the, put, make sure that the, the grains on the bottom are lit. Okay. So I have a large beaker of water here with some, um, coarse sand and fine gravel grains, just natural grains distributed randomly across here. Now what happens here, I'm going to start stirring this and I can generate literally uh, solid, or sorry, um, body rotation. Now water has a, and other fluids have a particular property in that you can stand by for just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. If this, were, if this was solid body rotation, then fine, I could just get the whole plug going, right? But water and oil and maple syrup is sticky. It has viscosity. And water less sticky than oil or maple syrup, but the point is it has a viscosity. And what that means is that each molecule of water is exchanging momentum with the immediately adjacent molecule, right? And what that means right next to the wall of the beaker here, that very last molecule of water is at zero velocity. It's a no-slip condition, right? The, the last molecule of water is not moving because it's in contact with a stationary wall. Interesting, right? And so that sets up a velocity profile in here. It's not just solid body rotation. And in fact, the centrifugal uh, acceleration I'm generating here with, associated with the rotational motion sets a, uh, a buildup of water against the wall. And because the... Um, the, the velocity profile, the, velo the velocity of water moving toward the outer wall during rotation is not uniform anywhere within the, uh, within the cylinder. I now have a setup on the walls, and that's like a pressure buildup that wants to push the underlying water back the other way. So while the water in the upper part of the column, due to a centrifugal acceleration, is moving to the outside, the water right near the bottom is moving back toward the center. Right? So let's just try to visualize that now. I have to get it going. Uniformly distributed around the bottom of the jar. And after a while, I mean, everything is moving with the rotation, but at the same time, it's moving into the center of the beaker. Oh. <laughs> now, what does this mean for a river? It means that the water is building up on the, thank you very much hand for my <laughs> um, the water builds up if an originally initially straight channel has any sort of natural perturbation because it's never truly straight so it'll be a slight curve on the outside bend of that curve there will be a buildup of water and the water is accelerating around that very minor minute curve and if it happens to calve off some sediment that sediment is immediately translated to the inner bank, right? So it cuts the outer bank and takes it across to the inner bank. Now, we're not in a cylinder, we're in a river that has forward downhill momentum. 
So that means that the secondary flow, this rotational flow that's set up, is actually helical, a corkscrew. So the material that's cut on this outer bank, eroded from this outer bank, is now translated downstream and deposited on the inner bank, creating a point bar where we like to go camping when we're rafting or paddling, right? Does that make sense to everybody? What's more, um, because the river has momentum, that erosion, the, the maximal erosion, is not occurring right at the apex, if you will, of the outer bank, but actually just a little downstream of it. So over time, by that I mean decades and centuries, meanders move downstream, hmm. right? This is all Albert Einstein, and this, this has stood the test of time. This is the basis of our understanding of meanders. Albert Einstein, 1926. Who knew? Right? Okay. So, um, oh, it seems to be in the blood. <laughs> More people stories. Albert Einstein uh, had a son, Hans Einstein. And uh, Hans Einstein went on, himself. you've never heard of him, right? No. He went on himself to be a, a very well-renowned hydraulic engineer on the faculty at Berkeley, another one, another Berkeley guy. And there's an apocryphal story, oh, so a hydraulic engineer, it means he's interested in the physics of flow, fluid dynamics. <laughs> He was uh, on the Faculty of Civil Engineering for 30 years at Berkeley. And there's an apocryphal story that uh, Father Albert advised his son Hans to go nowhere near fluid dynamics and the study of turbulence because it was intractable and an intellectual graveyard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, cosmology was okay, but turbulence, no. Uh, yeah, there you go. So anyway, this is where I come in. I have a geophysical background, and I'm just interested in the forces, the processes that shape the world in which we live, earth surface processes. And I've worked on anything from um, marine processes, coastal processes. I have a paper going on right now looking at sediment transport on the Oregon Shelf. But I've also had a long-standing interest in, uh, in sediment transport and rivers. And I've just always been taken with this notion of a river as the carpenter of its own edifice. And that's a wonderful metaphor. And what does it mean to the left brain physicist in me? So that's where I come in, and that's what I'd like to share with you. Um, and the problems of interest to me are pretty fundamental, I guess to many, seemingly pretty academic. But there are good reasons, as I tried to lay out in my teaser paragraph that went up on the website, why we should be interested in uh, these processes, the, the relationships between process and form in river channels, uh, it, has a, it has a real bearing on, as I say, the world in which we live. But there are a lot of things going on now that we need to be paying attention to. Just think about this for a minute. Uh, this came out in a paper from some um, river policy people down at UNH in the last couple of years. Approximately one third of all humans currently lives within three kilometers, about two miles, of a non-urbanized river. Uh, that's amazing to me. Yeah. By non-urbanized, what I mean is it hasn't been, it's not a concreted over drainage channel. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. the Merrimack going through Manchester is not necessarily, in my view, an urbanized river because in places it's got concrete banks, but it's still pretty wild down there, right? On the other hand, I gave a talk on some of this material that I'm giving here at Cambridge last year. Um, I used to work at Cambridge. It was wonderful to go back and see old colleagues and friends. And of course, if you've ever been there, the River Cam. Has anybody ever been to the River Cam? My wife is an avid rower. She was really keen to go. That must be one of them now calling. <laughs> she was very keen to go and row on the River Cam. If you've ever been there, it's only wide enough to take one shell at a time, and it's basically a concrete drainage ditch. Not very pretty. Even behind, in the backs, behind all of the colleges, with the willows weeping over the, it's beautiful, but when you go up and look at the channel, it's, it's a concrete channel. Um, anyway, that's an urbanized river, right? Uh, even in places here, Blood Brook, the major riprap that they've done after Irene, that's kind of urbanized at this point, because it's now constrained. But most of Blood Brook and Mink Brook, over in Hanover, these are our two uh, lab rats, if you will, our laboratory, our natural experimental animals that we have uh, nearby. 
they're, they're pretty wild. Um, so anyway, what else did I want to say? So to, uh, yeah, one third of all humans within two miles of a non-urbanized river, literally to understand the processes that shape rivers is to understand the world in which we live, most of us live. Okay, what else? Worldwide, there are currently, wait for it, I mean, it's just 40,000 dams worldwide with heights greater than 15 meters, 50 <coughs> meters, 40,000. <coughs> Wilder Dam is 12 meters. It doesn't even count in this census. Yeah? Uh, just under half of these, 19,000, are in China alone. <coughs> 5,500 of them are in the U.S. Many of these, uh, you know, were built in the post-war generation. 1950s through 60s was an amazing period of dam building in this country. And as it turns out, as we're all learning in the modern era, because of the time value of money, we only build things that last about 50 years. That includes shopping malls, nuclear power plants, and dams. It's just not worth building them for the long haul. Two generations, and you got to get your money out of it, right? So the dams are now coming, that were built 40 to 50 years ago, are now coming to the end of their useful lives. And we're facing a societal challenge as to what to do with them. So a lot of the grant money I generated over the last 10 years was looking at the effects of dams on rivers. And we played that out. So now we're looking at the effects of taking dams off rivers. Um, and it's a big deal right now. I mean, you may have seen in the headlines, the big one last year, the largest dam removal in history was the uh, blow and go on the Elwha in Washington state. You've seen the pictures. Uh, literally, blow and go is the technical expression. They just dynamite it on day zero and let the river take over. And there was this amazing um, pulse of sediment because it, you know there was 50 years of sediment impounded behind that dam, and now it's a run of the river channel, just uh, excavating all that material. And there were large plumes emptying out into Puget Sound. Locally, we have lots of, I can't remember how many dozens of small dams that you wouldn't even have heard of have come out on New England uh, channels over the last decade or so. Hmm. One that we've studied intensively over the last few years is the, um, I have to always remember the name, the one on the Ashwela, uh, the Homestead Woolen Mill Dam in West Swansea. That was basically a blow and go, um, 65 meter high structure. Oh, sorry, that was the Elwha. What was the, I don't have the, uh, the Homestead Willow <coughs> Dam. I have it somewhere here, but I'm not quite sure what it is. But uh, basically, that was a 200-year-old structure right outside a mill. And uh, they just removed it in a day. And basically, 200 years of sediment impounded behind there is now was that? West Swansea on the Ashwela in New Hampshire. And now that material is reworking downstream toward the Connecticut and reshaping the channel. And I'm going to come back to that. That's one of our projects uh, that we're working on right now. So they never dug any of that sediment out? No. no never. Would that be a downside? To that? You know, Sorry? That's a downside to that because you don't know where the sediment's going or what's in the sediment. Well, that, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, not so much what's in. I'm the physicist part, not the chemist part. I don't think that there are any nasties in the sand that's been accumulated. I mean, it's, it's downstream from Keene. I don't know what goes on in Keene, but I don't think anything too nasty, to be honest. It's more a matter of um, fouling the downstream just with particulate sediment and as it affects fisheries, really. Uh, Do they take down any of the structure prior to blowing it up? Yeah, it depends on what the most efficient way is. I don't think that, I wasn't there for the actual blow and go. Usually what they do is they dismantle most of it. Okay. And then just blow a hole in the, at the, to open it and then uh, um, finish, complete the removal. Okay. Is it, is it detrimental to do that? Is it worse to blow and go than Then what? I mean, it's kind of hard to. Right. What does one do? I mean, it's the, actually the most efficient way to go, probably economically, and just get on with it, right? So did they lower the water level behind the dam drastically before they do that? Yeah. Or is there a big rush of water? No, it's, it's somewhere in between. Right? <laughs> yeah, they lower it as much as they can, right? Some of these, they don't, I mean, there isn't a gate that they can just open it up, right? It's like a weir 
that they can lower, so they can lower, get the, the level as low as possible, and then just blow it. I'm not allowed to have exhibits. I mean, we have great pictures of this process, uh, but uh, you have to come to another lecture sometime. Okay, so that's, that's human-made perturbations uh, on a fairly local scale. That is the uh, emplacement and now increasingly the removal of dams. Um, why else should we care? There's another man-made perturbation going on right now. Our climate is changing. Meteorologists consider trends in contiguous precipitation regions, CPRs. Contiguous precipitation region, it's a fancy way of saying New England or the heartland of Midwest, right? I mean, it's a region that shares a fairly uniform and steady um, rainfall record, right? I mean, it rains about the same here as it does in Maine the same times of year, the same amounts, and so forth. So this is, New England would be a, a continuous, contiguous precipitation region. Understood? As opposed, say, to the Pacific Northwest, west of the Cascades. And then east of the Cascades, different again. Understood? Okay. So, we all have heard the evidence for global warming and the predictions that in, say, 100 years, it could be up to, gosh, 6 degrees, 7 degrees warmer anywhere from zero to several degrees warmer over the next century or so, right? And associated with that, the meteorologists say that uh, in, over, oh, sorry, so over the last hundred years, so for, historically, and then projecting forward, the number of regions reporting extreme events, and that is some multiple of average rainfall. Think Irene. Mm -hmm. um, the number of regions in North America reporting extreme events and the number of extreme rainfall events per region are both increasing. Right? So it's not only getting warmer, but it's getting wetter. And that's not surprising. Do you guys know from a physicist's point of view what the main role of hurricanes is? It's, it is the poleward heat transfer mechanism. <coughs> right? Water is evaporated and that heat is taken northward and the raining out is transporting heat with condensation and rain out, there's release of heat, and it's taking equatorial heat northward toward the poles. So with warm, it, one could imagine that with increasing warmth, depending on where that is concentrated, as it's redistributed uniformly around the globe, things might get wetter in certain places. That seems to be the case. Is that why there's more melting at the poles? More, you know, more heating at the poles, it's, the melting of the Arctic. Yeah, I'm not sure all of the, the reasons that the poles are so sensitive. <clears throat> I don't know the reasons for that. Mm -hmm. But they are regarded as the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, in any event, so warmer and wetter. So we can expect over the next hundred years, they tell us, going from the conifer forests and boreal hardwoods to uh, um, temperate hardwoods. So going from Maple and Beach to Oak and Beach, right? Not so good for the sugaring. So anyway, in face of environmental change, whether it be putting dams on, taking dams off rivers, longer term climate change, including wetness, meaning rainfall, that means runoff, that means water in the rivers, right? Discharge. Uh, it's worth asking, how might channels respond to this, to any of these perturbations, either you know, a one-day blow-and-go dam removal or a steady increase in wetness over the next century or so, and therefore an increase in discharge. Yes. Yeah. question. Um, when the dams were built 50 or plus years ago, was it mostly for control of water flow? Or uh, it's, it's a real mix. I mean, in the uh, southeast, a lot of it was during Roosevelt and make work and recreational use, right? So now there's a strong lobby for from all those bass fishermen not to get rid of those dams. <laughs> up here in New England, uh, I know, you know, it's all anecdotal, but a lot of the dams up here were for flood control. There was a 1927 flood, very costly, both in property and lives, and it was sort of a never again type attitude. And we, so, um, like the uh, Union Village Dam was definitely flood control. A lot of it is for power. Uh, the major dams on the Connecticut for hydroelectric power as well as flood control. Okay? Is that?
So it's, it's a mixed bag. Okay. Um, all right. So, how the rivers might change. And when, to answer this question, one needs to address the more fundamental question of how predictable is river ge geometry. Thus, the second part of my title, no one steps in the same river twice, and yet, there are predictable aspects of rivers, and that's where I come in as a physicist. Uh, I want to be able, I'm a bit of a reductionist. It means I want to start small and recreate the world up rather than top down. And I tend to think of things right at the viscosity or grain level, how sand grains move, and can I build a river bottom up uh, using physical laws and principles, physical, the understanding of the physics of the processes. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And the first, we have to talk a little bit about some fundamental parameters. The first thing we need to know is just that uh, the, the, the primary driver in all of this is discharge. How much water is flowing down the river? Volume per minute, per second. So you've heard of cubic feet per second, that sort of expression. And, uh, and I'm a scientist, I would prefer to think in cubic meters per second, or cumex. And I'll try to translate here for you, but just to give you context, the Connecticut River at Wilder Dam has an average discharge of about 10,000 cubic feet per second. It's about 3,100 cubic meters per second, or if you want to think about it, about 3,100 large chest freezers per second. Uh, very, very large bathtubs or, cube, or uh, chest freezers. That's a cubic meter. 3,100 per second. Uh, a bank full, let's see, Mink Brook. Oh, sorry. The other thing that we want to know, that's the annual average. And what geomorphologists think of as the formative discharge, that is the, the magnitude of flow that is responsible for sculpting the channel, is called the bank full discharge. It's basically that discharge associated just with filling the channel, another cubic foot, and it would overtop and start to flood onto the floodplain. So that's called bankful. And that typically occurs, interestingly enough, about one, every, once every year or two years. So, and it's typically around twice or some multiple of the average. So in the Connecticut River case, looking at the wild part of the river below the dam there, the bankful would probably be about twice or 20,000 cubic feet per second to actually fill those maps. In contrast, Mink Brook and Blood Brook here, they're equivalent more or less in size in terms of drainage area and the channels and everything. Their, their bank full discharge are about one cubic meter per second. About, um, yeah, that's about right. Anyway, so uh, we can relate with and uh, depth and flow speed to discharge. A simple relationship, a simple statement of conservation of mass, because mass is conserved, neither created nor destroyed. We do it in terms of flow rate, the, the rate of mass flowing down a channel. So just the product of a characteristic flow speed, bankful width and bankful depth, gives you the bankful discharge. Everybody okay? Yeah? You're averaging everything out. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it varies greatly. It like does. Blood Brook right now has a very low flow. Yes, it does. So that's so we're looking for some characteristic central value right. that is represented, and we tie it to this bank full condition. Okay. Yeah, that it's the way we go, and it actually ends up being quite powerful. In some places, however, you you need to look at the variability. In a place like New England where it's very temperate and wet, the average of the bankful value is good because I'm going to lapse into some technical language here, but the mean, or the average, the first moment is a good representation of what's going on. Yeah, but like the San Juan River. Exactly. You go to the southwest, the average flow is zero. Now you're, you're looking at the standard deviation. You need to know what the variability is about the mean. Does that make sense? Here, we're, we're good here. In the southwest, no. Are you happy now? You good? Happy or happy? No, you, you landed on something very good. I mean, we're trying to find a characteristic value. I deal with students all the time. You know, the average grade in this class is this, and that is 
that tells us a lot about what's going on. Dartmouth students are all above average. They're all above average, that's right. <laughs> Boy, you, you've got your finger on all the problems here. Right? <laughs> all right, so that's fine. But it goes to hell in a hurry from there. Not only do we conserve mass, it's neither created nor destroyed, but a river in any one locality is not <coughs> wildly accelerating or decelerating. So that means momentum is also conserved. And when you introduce this, and this has really only been a realization, Luna Leopold was very big on just stopping with conserving mass, and then getting all sorts of uh, empirical power laws that, um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but the angels are coming. Yeah, right yeah. Sorry? <laughs> sorry? where you start singing. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's only been in the last generation, and I've been pleased to be a part of it, that we are, are trying to layer on more complicated statements, including conservation of momentum here. Once you do that, you can start to relate discharge to geometry, slope, uh, grain size, because there's sediment transport laws, and everything, everything just starts falling out. So literally, uh, there's a wonderful book out Gosh, it was wonderful. A couple of years ago, some of you may have heard of it. It's called uh, Consider a Spherical Cow. And it was this wonderful exercise book on back of the envelope calculations in environmental sciences. You know, like, you know, how many cows does it take? I don't know. I can't remember. But it's all these back of the envelope wonderful things. And I kind of like, how do you build a half pipe river? You know, back of the envelope, starting with some very simple things, we can actually predict the geometry of rivers. And so what I want to just walk through now is telling you, I'm not going to go into any of the detail, but if we were, let's see, when we put all these equations together, they're all interrelated, and the big thing that we need to understand is friction. The resistance that the water uh, imparts onto the stable bed and vice versa because everything is in balance. And most of you are familiar with friction. I'm going to give another little demonstration here. I think most of you are familiar with solid friction. Just have a wood block here on a wood sheet, right? And you know from trying to push somebody across the linoleum floor or move a refrigerator or anything like that, you're trying to push it in this direction, but the resistance that's opposing you is proportional to the normal force down, the weight of the object. It's easier to push a small object than a refrigerator across the floor, right? So in this case, friction, the resistance in this direction is proportional to the force in the vertical, the weight. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's called Coulomb friction, solid body friction and it works for this block. And of course, if I start tilting this sheet, the downslope or down sheet component of the weight is proportional to the slope and the thickness of this block. Right? Everybody with me? And it has to overcome the resistance proportional to the weight of the block, which is the thickness of this block resolved in the direction perpendicular to the sheet now. You with me? And that's what gives rise to what's called angle of repose. Because the angle of repose just equals the non-dimensional friction coefficient. So when I bring this up to just the right angle, the downslope component now exceeds the component of weight that's left pushing against the sheet. Understood? That's solid body friction. The same principle holds in, in water. The downslope component of the tractive force is a product of the depth of the water, the thickness of the block, and the slope down which it's sliding. Okay? But the friction is different. It's not proportional to the weight of the water. It has more to do with the geometry of the bed. For example, how rough the grains are compared to the thickness of the, the depth of the flow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So once we start layering in all these more complicated expressions for friction and understanding how something at that very smallest scale, the grain scale, uh, affects the larger flow properties, it's just amazing to me that something on the granular scale, friction, is now determining the depth and the width uh, and the slope 
of the river. Very cool. It's bottom up rather than top down. All right, so what do we do? Just for Mink Brook here, we're doing this for rivers worldwide. I've been uh, working on compiling the data. <coughs> but just for Mink Brook, so that you can think of it right here. Mink Brook and Blood Brook. What do we need to know to predict the channel? What do I need to know to build a river? Right? A natural river. I want it to be natural. What do I need to know? So one way we do this uh, is just as we start to build these equations and add in more complexities, we can use what's called an R squared value, and that's basically telling you the fraction of variability that's explained by the particular model that we're generating. Like an R squared of 1 means you have perfect correlation between model and observation, and it means you nailed it, right? So basically, if we just use conservation of mass, just discharge, we can predict width and depth to within about 30 to 30% 50% of the variability. That means we can accommodate that much range in the variability, right? We can explain that much. Uh, that means that what that's telling you is that about half the variability in width that we see in rivers is just a matter of scale. The more discharge or water flowing down the channel, the bigger the channel. Like, duh, right? And that's no problem. It's just a matter of scale. But that only that explains about half of it. And when we start layering in these increasingly complex, complex expressions for friction, we can get actually up over 90% of the variability. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. And they, these are fairly simple uh, equations. It's not that bad. Now, there are a couple of things I learned from this I want to make very clear. One is, as I've already said, it's just, to me, it's um, a transcendent experience for me that I can, that we can build a river from the grain up, if you will, and, and identify a certain fraction of the variability in natural rivers, say up to 75 to 90 percent of the rivers. Of course, it's that last 25 to 10 percent of variability that we can't explain, just like in humans. Humans all have general characteristics that we share, but it's that last few percent that makes each individual place um, unique and inspiration for great art and uh, wonderful inspiration for musings on a summer evening, right? But um, it's important that as we go toward river restoration, that we have some constraints, what a channel, a, if, if we're trying to restore a once perturbed channel to a natural state, it's good to have some predictive equations that, uh, well, if this much discharge is rolling down and the, grain <coughs> and the grain size is this, then, um, you know, width and depth of the channel needs to look like this. Right? Now, having said that, as transcendent as it is and as self-satisfied as I am with all that, I need to tell you that there's still a lot of natural noise. Even with all this success, we can really only predict these properties of a channel to within about a factor of two. That's a lot for a human that owns property on the river, right? Mm -hmm. So a factor of two in a natural system, believe me, scientists are pleased with that, to actually get in a chaotic natural system. This is good if you can predict something to within a factor of two. Of course, if you own property on a riverbank and it's um, 10 meters wide, the river, and it goes to 15 meters, that's that's within noise, as far as I'm concerned, but it's a catastrophe for the homeowner. And that actually comes to play a lot in the effects of Irene. Irene was a world-class event for this region. It was the largest event on record, a historical record for many locations. Wrecked havoc in terms of uh, property loss and displacing people, so I don't mean to undercut it at all. But we go out and we survey the channels, and um, it's if we plot them up, the changes from what it was pre-Irene to after Irene in terms of channel geometry, it's all kind of within the noise. But I'm going to talk about where it was significant, um, the real lasting effect of Irene coming up. But in any event, uh, that kind of wraps it up for this aspect of it, just the, the channel <laughs> geometry, the kinds of things we're working on right now. Are there any questions just on that? Yeah. So are you measuring the substrate yeah. in different sections of the We do. River? We do it. Uh, graduate students are wonderful things. <laughs> <Yeah>. They're <laughs> characterizing the size of the... They are. And, you know, it, 
for if it's sand, they can literally just collect a lot of it and then um, analyze it in an automated way. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the, around here, we have coarser grain rivers. They're usually cobbles, mm -hmm. and they have to do counts. So mm -hmm. they sit there with calipers and mm -hmm. measure the the intermediate axis of. Uh, <laughs> it's nice on a summer day. Yeah. <laughs> But literally, I just heard a talk today from a graduate student that uh, there's a new device out, an algorithm, it's an uh, application that you can put in a digital photograph of the bed, mm. and then it does a fancy analysis of all of the shading, and it spits out the equivalent of the graduate student's pebble counts. They're wow. very happy about that. <laughs> And just all else being equal, a uh, high friction bed with the uh, wider channel? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, and this comes as a surprise to me. The most sensitive aspect, I would have thought that if you had made the bed rougher and created more friction, that what happens is it should be deeper to overcome that friction because the, the downslope force is the product of depth and slope, right? Uh, depth is not the most sensitive to friction, it's width. And that just, something on the grain or scale can translate into like two or three steps away in terms of thinking as a mathematician. Like, width is the most sensitive to friction. So yes, uh, a rougher bed, a coarser grain bed will result in a wider channel. Why that should be. How long will it take for all the wonderful riprap put in 400 miles of trout streams ruined after high rain to recover to a more or less natural state? That's what we're looking at right now. I'm going to get to that in a moment if I don't address that because that's the next subject, right? Okay. So another project that I'm working on has to do with, we're very interested in the time scale aspect of it, but that's hard to get at because one of those natural experiments that you don't know it's done until you've actually let it run its, run its course, right? But um, it turns out that the, the largest effect that we can see is that uh, during Irene, the river uh, was at very, very high stage. All the rivers, but when I say river, all the rivers. The Deerfield was hit really hard down in Massachusetts. The White and the Saxons were hit very hard. Um, and at, during the actual event and immediately after for days to weeks, the river was 10 to 20 times muddier than it was before the hurricane. And let me explain what that means. Geomorphologists, hydrologists use what's called a rating curve. That means um, discharge on the horizontal axis, how much water is moving, and concentration of sediment in the water column on the vertical axis, right? And we, there's, a, there's, as you might imagine, a proportional relationship. More water moving through, it can transport more sediment, and it's nonlinear. So it, uh, it actually, you know, it can concentrate more sediment and therefore actually be muddier the more water is flowing. Okay? And then for Irene event and immediately after, that curve was offset by at least a uh, factor of 10 to 20. And what happened, and this leads me into the next focal point of our research, is that um, <clears throat> um, what we observed is, yes, there was catastrophic for individuals, local bank erosions and so forth, but what we really see is the mobilization of large landslips and bank failures. Like the, not necessarily where somebody's property farm yard is, but where the hills actually abut right in the stream. Lots of, uh, we can identify these, thousands of them uh, throughout Vermont. And basically, we've rendered our rivers muddy, muddier. And it's not clear how long it will take to clear that out. But it's still muddy, even now. Um, so here's where I come in again. I. Uh, wanted to generate an algorithm that was fairly user-friendly to predict where along river channels uh, we might expect erosion and or deposition. It's not just a matter of the headwaters erode and everything gets taken down and deposits lower in the river. Our rivers are in places bedrock constrained. 
and there are lots of benches and so forth. They're very irregular. And so the river, we would like to have an algorithm that could predict where along, say, the White River we might see a preponderance of these landslips and where that stuff goes if it does happen. And, um, pencil to paper, working things out, I could basically boil it down to what geomorphologists have empirically identified as the stream gradient index. I gave it a physical significance, and not only that, I took it one step further and showed how it gradients in the stream gradient index could uh, tell us where um, the channel is vulnerable to erosion or subject to deposition. The stream gradient index is just the product of distance downstream from the headwaters and the slope at a point. Right? So if you're somewhere on the White River, um, Royalton, you know, you're, you're so many tens, maybe even 100 kilometers from the headwaters at that point, and the, the slope at that point, the product of those two values is the stream gradient index. And where that's increasing, it means that the stream is actually accelerating with regard to ability to erode and transport sediment. And where the gradient in that is positive, it means the river, sorry, negative, it means the river is debouching and losing steam, and therefore probably dropping sediment. So what do we do? Two different applications. One was this uh, Ashuela River Dam. We sent, we just had a PhD student, John Gardner, he just finished. We had two wonderful quasi-natural experiments occur during his PhD tenure here. The removal, removal of the Ashuela Dam, and then Irene. For the Ashuela Dam, he took this method that I've developed, very simple GIS, I'm kind of an armchair geomorphologist. I'd like to sit in the comfort of my office and make all these predictions and then send out my minions to test them. <laughs> and he did a great job. The, the point here was that, okay, if the dam is removed and all this sediment is now released, where will it end up? Where will, the, where will this big pile of sand that was impounded behind the dam be most vulnerable to incision to this newly evolving channel that's cutting through it? And that's going to move it downstream below the one-time dam location and predicting where it will actually deposit and foul the channel. And this algorithm did a really amazing job. It's very nice, very powerful. Uh, and so that worked very well. So then the next thing was Irene. And John did a great job. I didn't quite know how to test it because we weren't seeing the sediment transport, per se. But he got all the wonderful aerial photos Overflights. This is literally something you could do in Google Earth if the flight, the timing of the flights was appropriate. But he got the official government aerial photos and he counted up number and volume of uh, landslides and landslips and bank failures along the White and the Saxons River. And then he also went out and surveyed the channels to s figure out where any of that material, as it was moving downstream, deposited. And again, this algorithm was very powerful in predicting. Now, we're still working on a lot of bugs. I don't, we're not there. There were a lot, for, a lot of example false positives. By that I mean, uh, from the comfort of my office, I would have said this reach of river was vulnerable to erosion, but it wasn't, in fact. And now we're looking at each of these cases in the field, case by case, to try to figure out. A lot of times it's because, as I mentioned earlier, the channels are bedrock constrained. They're just locked in by very firm bedrock. I mean, there, nothing was going to fail, right? They're just a, a shoot. Other places, uh, I would have said that it, would have, it was stable, nothing would have happened there. And in fact, there was lots of scour. And that's usually in places where there uh, was a man-made structure, like a bridge, a bridge abutment that precipitated scour. Right? But, and then there are still a lot of places that we just don't they're at odds with what, I, what we would have predicted, and we're trying to figure out why. So I, I'm going to wrap it up there. I realize this is a little different than what you're used to, but we're doing lots of really, in my view, interesting and exciting things. And uh, they're, they're working out. And uh, we're trying to understand uh, how to build natural rivers, or understand how they form themselves. And it informs our efforts to restore rivers to natural state. What should we expect? What should we be looking for? And also, what is the range of natural noise in there? We 
don't, we're not looking for precision here, but we need to know um, what to expect in terms of the characteristic value and what's acceptable about that ex characteristic value for any given conditions that we impose on the river. And finally, we're trying to, uh, or secondly, we're trying to develop algorithms and testing them in the field for understanding where river channels are vulnerable to erosion and then subject to downstream deposition for the mobilized material. So, happy to take any additional questions. Yes, ma'am. How do you feel about this year's winter with the ice jams and the snow and everything? How is that going to impact I, the rivers? Ah, okay, your first part, how do I feel about the winter? I <laughs> <laughs> From your arm chair, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, you know what, I'm not sure. I, I don't really have an answer for it. I mean, there have been severe winters before, like, and we just had um, an event that went beyond historical record in Irene in terms of a runoff. Event. And as I say, I don't mean to downplay, it was catastrophic for many individuals, but it didn't change the river. It didn't overhaul the river. I, I lived in Cornish at the time, and I was in the eye of the storm. I had no idea what was going on because it was sunny and dry. <laughs> it was bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, it was very hit or miss. Um, you know, I mean, I live up on Bragg Hill, and Bragg Hill washed out, but other than that, there wasn't much damage in there. Sir, you had a question. Um, does anybody have a handle on, on the I say, physics of the riverbed? What happens with uh, flowing in water doesn't it create some pressure differences in this in the in the riverbed and isn't there leaching of material or yes. forcing material or what what sort of happens? Absolutely, there is significant exchange with the overlying water column, and um, I have a wonderful facility and we've looked at that. I've got a flume where I set students up, and it has a false bed and we fill the this recessed bed with gravel, and then run water over it and uh, track dye infiltrating into the bed. And it's basically a function of flow speed. I mean, the, the, the faster the water, the faster the flow-driven diffusion of contaminants or dye or salt, whatever tracer we use, into the porous bed. Now, you have to be a little bit careful. That's a, uh, a construct of what's called a neutral stream. That is, Many natural streams are gaining streams. They're fed by groundwater, right? I mean, a lot of our streams here are not gaining. <clears throat> they are neutral, and they are just fed by surface runoff. Um, so, it's, so it's applicable here. But in many locations, uh, I know down south in karstic areas like limestone in Pennsylvania, the, the lovely trout streams down there in the limestones are, are gaining because of the subsurface flow. And literally, the streams are gaining water, not necessarily from surface runoff, but literally from groundwater percolating up, right? So that would negate anything that I just described, because now the pressure is <coughs> driven from the groundwater coming in from the hill slopes. Is that? Do, do underground rivers have the same physics as surface rivers? Uh, yes and no. I mean, if it's a free surface flow, then sure, but if it's a conduit flow, then no. The, the free surface of a river is very important yeah. in its physics. Yes, sir. I have a question about oxbows. I grew up on a farm over on the Saco River in North Conway, and the bank, the, the, the bank would spall off on the outside. There was this curve like this, and the I could stand, when I was a young adult, I could stand with the water almost up to my shoulders. Yeah. And then the river broke through yeah. and made, and it, it floods enough in the spring that sometimes we have not just trees, but big icebergs stranded in the field. So there's a lot of water there. <coughs> but it broke through and made a straight channel, and now that place that used to hold, say, four feet plus of water, silted in. there might be, well, it doesn't feel like it was all silted in. Maybe it did, but sometimes the water is only five, six inches deep, and I don't understand how, if water seeks its own level, that whole oxbow could be so empty of water when it's right next to the river channel. <laughs> yeah, so this phenomenon is called, the technical term, 
uh, you say breakthrough, is avulsion. And if we could figure that out, uh, we could put the Army Corps of Engineers out of business. <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, channels, you know, what makes a channel um, vulnerable to avulsion? And there are a couple of things. One is that these rivers build themselves up such that they can literally be higher than the, than the floodplain, right? And now you can imagine in this oxbow, I don't have an exhibit, so it's very difficult, but going into this oxbow, this very tight bend, this is now the outer bank, right? Where, where it evolves, where it broke through. So that is a, a locus of erosion. And presumably it's a fairly steep slope right there, and it just found a quicker way, not to anthropomorphize, but it literally found a lower energy, lower effort way to make that transit right through there. And once it's cut, uh, it's cut. I mean, it's it's the preferred way to go. And did it build up its own berm yeah. to prevent water from flowing it, into the old oxbow? Well, again, we're anthropomorphizing it to, in that kind of language. But yeah, a berm was built yeah. and it, that seemed to have yeah. uh, stopped that. Yeah, right. The river doesn't have a will, per se. Uh, but yeah. Marking back to your comment about um, the Leopold family, um, a broad question, uh, and of course knowing um, that family's um, extraordinary contribution to conservation and stewardship of our planet. Yeah. Um, can you share with us any contribution that either your work or the work of your <coughs> colleagues and your students um, has contributed to the wild and scenic river system? Um, Nothing directly, yeah. I'm, uh, if you want to pursue the question a little bit more, that I mean, I'm not in contact with that group or anything like that. Yeah. I was curious. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Jim. Well, it, it, you know, speaking of the al algorithm, um, yeah. Has it, does that have any um, bearing on the Grand Canyon and how they want to re uh, get the beaches back in? Um, ah. I I don't know what the question really is. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, well, the Grand Canyon is a whole other question altogether. Oh. And, and the beaches, for sure. Um, what's going on in the Grand Canyon? And you've asked a wonderful question. I just, my wife and I just went down the Grand Canyon. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so you can imagine, the first thing I did was apply this algorithm to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. And it's pretty cool. It basically it, it, uh, it corresponds where there is incision going on or should be going on is right at where all the rapids are. And the rapids are, for the most part, controlled by uh, the, where the tributaries come into the main stem. Yeah. Because they bring in lots of debris flows and avalanche flows and boulders. <coughs> and then they drop them all there. Yeah. And that creates the, the rapids. But it also creates what are called little nick points in the river. So it's this yeah, staircase. No now, the, the, uh, the, the bars, the point bars. That's another problem. That's the, the, the emplacement of the Glen Canyon Dam and the impoundment of sediment behind that dam. Mm -hmm. The lower Colorado through the Grand Canyon is sediment starved. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. Uh, I think there was one question over here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get there. Two issues. The, the Oxbow just uh, hypothetically might have been a three-mile trip. Uh, which would have slowed the water down and, and had a, uh, a drop of whatever feet in, in the whole total of the oxbow. And you cut through, you only got a half a mile trip. So it's a much steeper it, slope. Yeah. It and would be so a deeper flow and it would have dropped the level up, up the upper part because it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Slow yeah. Down. No, I'm sorry. Sorry, so I didn't his, explain his, that. His reason might have been a drop. The, the, yeah, I, I guess I tried to say that by the. Uh, it was just a more direct route and less work. But also, because it was a shorter route, it's a steeper slope. And the attractive force, the ability of the stream to erode, is related to the product of depth and slope. So if it's a steeper slope, <laughs> the same depth of water, it can move a hell of a lot of sediment. And it can literally cut a channel below the level of the oxbow, which strands the oxbow, OK? And any water left in it. So. Um, I have one, one more. Yeah. Quickie. 
The, the uh, Connecticut River above Wilder Dam or Wilder Lake, whatever you want yeah, to call it. Lake Wilder. Is, uh, I'm the commodore of the Lake Wilder Yacht okay, Club. It, it, <laughs> it, it's always sediment loaded. It's always cloudy. You can't see anything in it. And other rivers seem to, seem to be you know, a lot, lot much clearer than that. And yet it's not moving very fast because it's got a really slow gradient because it's the lake. So what, what, why it do you should, have so much it should fall out and clear. And That's clear. what I think. Yeah, it should. <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't have an answer for it. Okay. Yeah. I, and I've got a question here and here. Yeah, Vermont just came out with these uh, fluvial erosion hazard maps, river corridors. It'd be interesting to compare. And I was curious how what you're talking about with your algorithm might affect their maps, or would it not make any difference that you're getting deposits? And erosion. They're, tr they're predicting where the rivers are likely to move over whatever time. Uh, I see. Be. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, they're, I bet they're complementary. I'm not sure. That, uh, but it would be interesting to see how they compare. For sure. yeah, they're on the ANR okay. uh, map Great. website. Thank you. Sir? I was curious if your algorithms are trying to factor in on a large wood debris at all. Yeah. No. no. I mean, this is just a really simple um, where, so basically it's, it's not flow speed that moves sediment, it's tractive force, right? And I can basically end up, it's, it's not how fast my hand is moving here to move this block, it's the force that I'm applying to, to drag it along, right? And that's what's moving sediment and shaping the river. And that tractive force, because it's a fluid, you don't deal with force, you deal with force per area or stress. And the units, it turns out the units are correct. It's the product of gravity, the acceleration due to gravity, the depth of the water, and slope. All right. And with some algebraic manipulation, I can turn that around just to being the product of distance downstream and slope. It's basically distance downstream is an is a analog for discharge. Right. The farther downstream you are, the more area you've had to collect. Right. So it's just a surrogate for that. And that's as far as it goes. So no bridge abutments, no woody debris, no riprap. This is just straight out where is the stream accelerating with regard to attractive force. So rivers basically adjust in a fine way to just carry the sediment load delivered to it. All right. That means that uh, a river can be moving at a good clip, but neither eroding nor depositing because it is adjusted to just carry the sediment load. So a lot can be in transport, that doesn't mean locally it's eroding. It's just adjusted to carry what it's got. Does that make sense to everybody? You're moving at just the right speed to carry the load you've got. And all of a sudden, if you pick up acceleration, that indicates to me that you have excess capacity to carry more. That's a place you should go look for erosion. On the other hand, if the river is losing steam, it's losing capacity to carry, that's a place I should go look to see that it's fouling the bed or depositing material. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Truly, it's as mindless as that, but I'd like to think that a little bit of effort went into that, but it's as simple as that. Now, there are all these other things going on, like woody debris and human structures and riprap and all that, that we have to go tease out case by case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, when they, when they do that release on the Glen Canyon Dam, I think they do it once a year, does that go on for like 24 hours? Or? Yeah, I'm not sure they even do it once a year. But they, they've had planned releases over the years. I don't know how long it goes on, but yeah. something like that, yeah. Is that a good thing, you think, they're, they're doing that? Or? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> because they have to release the sediment with it. All they're doing is, again, I just explained to you, if, if you increase the tractive force and don't give it the furniture to move around, the new furniture to move around, it's going to move whatever furniture is there, the point bars. And so what happens is it, it cleans out the bars even more. Right? Isn't some sediment coming out with it? Some. Yeah. But it's not, I don't think it's the way they open it. It's like an open run the river gate where all this, uh, 
40 years of sediment is now impounded, and it's not like they're tapping into that. They're just creating a high discharge event. Right. Mm -hmm. And some sediment, because you're draining the bathtub in a hurry, it stirs up some of that sediment and takes it with it. Yeah. But it's not like they're evacuating the reservoir of sediment. Yeah. So back to Jonathan's question about putting all that rock and stuff in the rivers after oh, the flood. Yeah. And it's kind of sh changed the flow of the river. Have you done some predictions to see how that's going to change the flow and the shape of the rivers? So I haven't done. No, not locally. But, but yeah, you asked the question. Will, Did I answer but, your question? No, not really. But so yeah, ask but it again, it and it I'll probably will change the shape of the flow. Well, of the I river think a lot, I think it's outside the scope of your study. It is because yeah. it's really biology, and and you your studies are physically based. In, in places, they're biologically motivated. I mean, I do work with. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, no, I'm not trying to denigrate you. I'm just saying that there's a lot of biology going on that can shape the world. That you're not including yet. Correct. And and I just have a friend who said that it's going to take 30 years or so for the river to get back to a natural state. Time scale. Probably which is a which is the based shape on will be different because of all the stuff. That it's empirically it based on experience, but so a couple of things. So time scale you asked about. Um, I mean, you know, one of the reasons we're trying to predict where the bed deposits is because that this has biological ramifications. It fouls the bed, uh, red sites. And so, you know, we're interested in that, and we're, we're, we're go, we go after that. Um, and one of the problems is that, you know, in our best intentions, we do open up dams and we release sediment. And what happens is we end up fouling the reach of the river immediately below the dam with the released silt that's been impounding, behind, collecting back there for a generation or two. Um, but you also asked time scale. We try to nail that when we can. That really has to be an, uh, a mathematical exercise, an inferred value, because if we came up with a value of 100 years or 30 years. Um, well, for example, there's a ship that was sunk in the Mississippi in yeah. 1855, and they found it 15 feet down in a farmer's field, about 300 yards from the river. <laughs> and then they started looking at the meanders of the Mississippi, which has a low gradient. And it's incredible. And you can just see from an aerial photograph how it's filled in. Sure. I mean, we've documented so meanders nice. on the Genesee River in New York and on the Winooski up here, like a meter per year. It's amazing. In, in a meander rate. That's the lateral movement. Yeah. They, I thought you were kind of asking, so the thing we're trying to address right now is that if Irene spiked the regional rivers and made them muddier, how long will that I'm not worried last? about the mud because that will go away, but I'm worried about the D8s and the excavators that rip the beds sure. apart. You, you're confident that it will go away, and I am too. I just don't know when. It could be 10 years. It could be 100 years. and that, That's of interest. And because that, to us, in, in our most uh, objective view, is that seems to be the significant effect of Irene. How do you measure the content of sediment in water? Do you do it with a Secchi ditch, ditch, uh, disc? Or do no, you do it, do it light, light transmissivity. Okay. Or you can just collect it with and a paper like this and measure and the measure. weight that's in there, right? Mm -hmm. Just cant off the water. Yeah, Susan. So if you can um, apply your algorithm to a natural river and say, in these places we expect to see erosion, in these places we expect to see deposition. That's the aim. Theory, We're working on it. Right? Um, could you then take that same river, kind of post Irene, post shoreline stabilization, and apply it again, considering all the places where the shoreline used to be erosive and is now stabilized by riprap, and predict how that stream is going to behave now as a result of all the things we did in response to Irene? I'm pretty sure it'll behave the way they wanted it to. That they've locked it in position, man. Yeah. yeah. It concrete. It's a it's an urbanized channel now. In certain places, it yeah. is. But I mean, then you you put riprap in there the size of small buildings. Um, it's going to take more than a thousand year event to change the channel. In that spot. In that spot. Right. And then the question is, what are the ramifications for all the places that they didn't riprap on that mm -hmm. same stream? Game on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have 
should ask a question from the point of view of the fish. I know you're not a biologist, but if there's all this sediment present in the river, do the square tails and browns, what are the, how I don't, they process? I have to defer to uh, others in the room. I don't know. I mean, a more significant issue for the fish is when they riprap, you usually lost your riparian buffer. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have what all the critters need to eat to supply the fish. You also don't have the shade. And once the water gets above 78 degrees, the, the uh, trout die. I was uh, recently uh, on the Big Island in Hawaii, and they have an active uh, lava flow. And I heard a volcanologist talk about it. And what he said is what we really think of is the lava flowing as a river. And we, uh, we use the same principles that a person who deals with water deal with when we try and predict where it'll go. And they said, uh, uh, and we're reasonably accurate. But when you look at the lines that they've drawn on maps, the lava tends to go to different places more often than the people who live there would like. <laughs> Do you think there's a, a close analogy between the flow of oh, sure. lava yeah. and the flow of, I mean, yeah. certainly it'll go downhill. So, yeah, look, just a, a larger aside here. I guess where I've made my mark that has really worked for me, um, you, you've all heard of F equals MA. Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. Incredibly powerful, and it's wonderfully applicable to planets and billiard balls, solid bodies. Not so good for continua, meaning earth materials, water, lava, air, soil. Um, yeah, what else did I miss? You got the idea. And so I teach a course where on day one, it's F equals MA, and then it goes to hell from there, because we have to develop an analogous expression um, for continua, for earth materials, and it's called Cauchy's Law. It requires a lot of vectorial calculus and so forth, and students burn me an effigy on the green when I teach it. <laughs> but it's extremely powerful because students, even in my, all scientists, quickly acquire labels. I'm a glaciologist, I'm a volcanologist, I'm a hydrologist. And the liberating aspect of this course that I teach is, once we've developed the mathematics, it's basically relating acceleration to the divergence of stress. Sorry, but I had to say it. And what you, that's apples and oranges. And what one needs to now do is understand the field of rheology, how materials respond to deformation. Viscosity is how we describe, relate the acceleration with the flow field. And that's Newton's great contribution. Viscosity is just an empirical coefficient with these really weird units that closed his hypothesis. It ends up being very powerful for anything from water to oil to lava to um, <coughs> maple syrup. For other things, you need other friction laws like the Coulomb friction, or you need something else for ice because it isn't a truly viscous material and so forth. So my point is that if it's week four, we're talking about the Earth's crust because that's one type of rheology. If it's week five, we're talking about ice because that's the next complicated form of rheology. And then we talk about viscosity, and that's lava and water and mud flows. And then once you talk about flow, water flow, then you allow turbulence to occur. And then we're talking about geophysical flows, like flows in rivers or really large lava channels. And so to me, it's just the same. Starting every Monday, it's the same equation. And then you put in the right viscosity and density values, and you're off to the races for a different application. Um, yeah, so that. Yes, I think it's truly applicable. But you have to have the right parameter values. And uh, is it turbulent or is it laminar, say? You know, is it so viscous that it's more like maple syrup oozing down rather than flowing in a turbulent way? Right? So that, that changes the properties. But it's the same starting point, speaking as a physicist mathematician. I, we're after well, 9 o'clock now. Yeah. Question. And I'm happy to, happy to take more questions. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around, but I realize some people need to get on with it. Yeah, hi. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but how do you feel about rebuilding the dam for the Norwich Swamp? <laughs> <laughs> oh, turn off, turn off. <laughs> Are you running for the slide board? <laughs>
swimming pool. Gosh, I, you know, I've enjoyed the swimming pool. I think they should put it. And I, I understand it serves a, an important purpose for water for the fire department. Um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't? No? Not worth it? I'm not sure that it ever had that much effect on the channel downstream. So I don't know. I don't have any strong feelings about one way or another. I know that we are all geared up. Um, one year I had a student that was actually going to look at the effects in the channel when they did their once a year release to drain the pool. But then the whole thing blew out. That would have been a good time to be there. <laughs> yeah, I can only put my students in harm's way in so many different ways there. I don't have any strong feelings about it. Though. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>